We drank this water all our lives, you know. It didn't hurt anyone. It was clear. Not worry about bacteria. It was uh, very safe for drinking. Our traditions and our, our, our culture and understanding of water is sacred to us and it's life. In a country like Canada, where fresh water is abundant, it's hard to imagine there are still many First Nations without clean drinking water. One of those communities is nestled in the Ojibwe territory of northwestern Ontario, where crystal clear lakes dot the pristine wilderness. Here, along the Manitoba Ontario border, is where the First Nation of Shoal Lake Number 40 is situated. Along the Trans-Canada Highway, 160 kilometers east of Winnipeg, there's a road that goes to the south, a winding 20-minute drive that passes through the First Nation of Shoal Lake Number 39. This is where the road ends, and where the final leg of the trip to Shoal Lake 40 begins. For locals, it's five bucks, so a return trip would be 10 bucks. Uh, locals and then elders, it's free. And uh, businesses, it's 10 bucks one way. The ferry is called Amik, Ojibwe for beaver. And like its namesake, it carries its load back and forth every day from early morning until late at night. Creep in, get the Atlantic soft. As the community is only linked to the outside world, the Amik transports just about everything, including its most precious cargo water. The story of how Shoal Lake 40 ended up without access to clean drinking water and how they were cut off from the mainland goes back a century. The city of Winnipeg way back over 100 years ago were looking for a body of water to supply their needs and they found uh, uh, the water up here on a higher elevation and uh, they came in and, and took uh, some of our land away just to accommodate their needs. Of course, this is an old map. This is dated 1881. This is where we had our village. We had a, a grave site there. They came and expropriated a big chunk of, I think it was about 3,000, I can't remember, acres or something like that. But a huge chunk of, of, of our land from here all the way this way. And in fact, they built a rail line uh, and they built uh, an aqueduct to have access to our water. And also a chunk of land this way here so that, so that they could build a dike and a channel through here, a canal through here. The building of this man-made channel forced Show Lake residents to relocate and it effectively cut them off from the mainland. The pipe is exactly on the spot where my ancestors were buried. So they dug up my ancestors, they dug up everything and removed them so that they could put this pipe, this hose, to feed the city of Winnipeg water. The 137-kilometer-long aqueduct that carries Shoal Lake water to Winnipeg was completed in 1919. Diversions of neighboring lakes into Shoal Lake to increase its flow would, over time, affect the water's quality, making it necessary that it be treated. Boil the water before you can use it, before you can drink it. That's what they tell us to do, because the water is getting to, to be contaminated now. You can't even drink it without getting sick. So what gives us life is dying. They essentially left us uh, on our own. You know, they didn't provide any of the, the treated water to our community members. Uh, they just uh, took it from us. And uh, it's like that to this day. In uh, one of the newspaper uh, articles that we were looking at, uh, the mayor at that time had said there are no um, 
inhabitants there, like in meaning this community, just Indians, he said. A lot of people have been uh, getting sick from bathing in the water, like they get um, blisters and um, boil-like um, sores on their bodies. People in the city, they don't uh, know where their water comes from. They don't know that uh, it comes from here, and they don't know like the people uh, suffering in order for them to um, bathe their children in um, clean water. Well, we've been under boiled water advisory since 1995-96. While other First Nations are re replacing their water treatment systems, we're, we're still waiting for ours. On top of this hill here is where the, uh, the water treatment plant was supposed to be built, right on here. Shoal Lake 40's efforts to build a water treatment plant have for years been denied by a federal government that refuses to pay for it. The reason, according to Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, is that it's too expensive to build a plant in a community that has no road access. All this crushed rock and sand, different grades of it, is, uh, was, was for the, uh, the water treatment plant that we're going we're gonna to have built up the road here. We spent a lot of money to get this here. A lot of time, a lot of effort was put into this by a lot of people to get this out here. We're just trying to exist and we're just trying to continue. We can't get anything done here. And yet we supply one of the largest cities in Canada, our water, and we can't even drink it. The band is forced to spend $240,000 a year to ship in bottled water while their neighbors at Shoal Lake 39 have a state-of-the-art water treatment plant. Shoal Lake 40's isolation gets worse when their ferry stops for the season. We're basically um, stranded here for two, two, two or three weeks. In the freeze-up time and when it starts to melt too in the, in the spring, if you need stuff, you have to cross the ice to get it. You have to drag the sled across with the groceries and the gas for the cars. We're going to be going across ice that's an inch thick, which is dangerous. There's been a, a lot of uh, drownings. There's been a, a lot of deaths because, you know, like some people might be stuck um, on, uh, on Band 39 side and they want to get home. People dying, you know, just trying to uh, make it uh, safely home. I fell through. And I was by myself, and you know, I didn't even yell because there's nobody out in the ice that's gonna hear me. I went right up to my waist, and then I had my wife and my uh, stepdaughter behind me. And if one of them went through, they might have went under the ice. So what I did is I put my arm in the water, put it on the ice, and it froze. And I did the same thing. And that's how I pulled myself up onto the ice. And when I got up on the ice, I, I rolled over, rolled away from it, and it let me go. While other communities are growing, this community is dying, we should be growing, but we're not because of access. 70% of Shoal Lake's population lives elsewhere with only 265 residents left on the reserve. In response to these challenges, Shoal Lake band members are turning to traditional ways. It is in these ancient practices where they're discovering the deep-rooted values and sacred knowledge that will guide them in their fight for a road and for access to clean, running water. <laughs>